Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Pastor. How's morning. everybody doing today? Good. <clears throat> good, good, good. Hey, you know, it's great to have a, a timer like that. We get started on time <laughs> these days. It's good to see everyone. I hope you're doing all well today. I was, as I was driving through town this morning, I see all these churches, uh, especially the big red one in the middle of uh, Fairport with the big steeple. And I was thinking, man, 100 years ago, I'm sure there was people just walking to church and that place was filled with people, especially in times of trouble, especially in times of World War, World War I, II, all that. I'm sure the churches were filled. And, you know, it just kind of reminds me today that, you know, our world is troubled, isn't it? <clears throat> and uh, the Lord allows things to happen and to shake things up, to shake us up. <clears throat> but it's good that we have a place to come to. And that's what I'm going to start out with today, Psalm 46. I'm going to read the whole thing because I just think everybody needs to hear this. <clears throat> to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song for Alamoth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah, which means think about that. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah, think about that. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. <clears throat> he makes wars cease to the end of the earth, he breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two, he burns the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Think about that. Through all of that, and that's a great psalm, especially that part, be still and know that I am God. As we come into his house today three times, David mentions a refuge. The Lord is our refuge. We thank him for this place that he has given us. I hope as you walk in here, you sense that this is a safe and secure place, and it's a place of refuge. And our, our focus should be on the God who saves us and keeps us. And as we sing today, I want you to sing with that in your hearts. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you today for your goodness to us. We thank you today that you have provided a place for us to find refuge. Lord God, that refuge is you, yourself, Lord. It's not really a building, it's you. And Lord, we come here to collectively worship you from our hearts today. You are worthy. Help us today to be still in our hearts and not let our hearts be troubled but to think on you and to remember who you are. You are sovereign over all things, <clears throat> and you are in control of everything. So, Lord, we bless your name today. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you all stand with me, and we'll sing our first song. <clears throat>
I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for you.
Lord, uh, we are so thankful, Father God, for your mercy for us. Lord, we don't deserve it, Lord. But it's not about us, Lord. It's about what you've done for us, Lord. And we're so thankful. We're so grateful to you, Lord, because you saved us, Lord. When you could have destroyed us, Lord. But you didn't because of your great love and mercy, Lord. And I just pray, wherever we find ourselves today, Lord, that we would draw close to you, Lord. Whether it repentance needs to be uttered from our mouths and our hearts, Lord. Wherever we are, help us, Lord God. We're, we're dependent absolutely on you, Lord. And Lord, we just pray, Father, that as we come forward to hear your word, as Pastor comes forward to bring what you've given him, Lord, fill him, fill us with your spirit, Lord. Help us to hear you, to hear your heart for us. And Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I so appreciate the, the worship that is supposed to... Uh, lead us to the throne room of grace and to uh, prepare our hearts to tender, make our hearts tender for the receiving of God's word. So I really do appreciate the worship today. I almost uh, hesitate to stop at all and give announcements. But we have to have these things. You've got to communicate. Just two announcements. Uh, next Saturday, there'll be a men's breakfast here at 8 in the morning. Uh, men will come together. We'll eat. We'll... Uh, talk about the Word of God, we'll fellowship, and if you need prayer, then we'll pray for each other. So next Saturday, uh, March the 5th, March. Okay. March. <laughs> and speaking of March, uh, on March 13th, two Sundays from now, we will have a church dinner. I like to call it a feast, Okay. Uh, right after church, we're going to do, there's a sign-up sheet over there if you want to sign up to bring anything for me to eat. <laughs> yeah, I'll share. <laughs> you know, as I was thinking about this uh, announcement, it reminded me of uh, Acts 2, 42 through 47. It speaks about the church. It was, it was, it was born that day, the day of Pentecost. And it says that uh, in those days they... The, the people that got saved, they were, uh, you know, paying attention to the apostles' doctrine. They were sharing their, their, their meals together. It says here, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. So that's what we're going to do. So if you want to stay after uh, two Sundays from now, we'll have a feast. And if you have something that you want to share with us, because what, what they also did was share. They didn't just share their food and sit down and talk. They shared testimonies, you know, what God has done for you. Maybe a favorite scripture, or even if you want to sing a song. Now, if you want to sing a song, you're going to have to talk to me. Because you can't just sing any song. <laughs> okay, it's got to be approved. But if you have something in your heart, and it doesn't matter if you... Ha, think you have a good voice or not, share that song with us, okay? Um, let's pray again. Father, we thank you. We thank you <clears throat> that we can come into your house and we can lift up our hands to you. We can lift up our eyes to you. We can lift up our souls to you. Lord, all the things that we sang about today are true. You are so good to us. We thank you. And, Lord, we sang about your mercy, Lord. Oh, Lord, where would we be without your mercy? You're a merciful God. We thank you for that today. Lord, we can come here. It says that we can come with boldness into your throne room of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, we need all those things. Lord, we do not have confidence in ourselves today. Maybe we didn't do so good this week. It's not that that brings us to the throne of grace. It's the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that. That because of the blood of Jesus, there is grace, unmerited favor, and mercy today. We thank you from our hearts today. And Lord, let your spirit, as we sang, the, the air I breathe, that's your presence, your spirit. 
and your word given to us, Lord. Give it to us today, Lord. Let us hear. Open our ears that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to each one of us individually today. And then let us respond to it, Lord, accordingly. We thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, and we'll continue on. Hopefully, we'll get through all the way to the end. It's not that far. I don't know, 10 verses or so. But you know, we've come this far. It's in the beginning. Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth. We saw the creation of everything and and mankind being formed and the first marriage, Adam and Eve. And and as they had children, you know what? Did I skip something? Yeah, there was an important event. They fell. They fell. But God's grace was there. And he showed them the way. And we talked about that way last week. It all has to do pointing to the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, We don't have to sacrifice a lamb anymore, do we? No. It's been done for us. But we can remember every day what he has done, and it's God's way. Uh, It's only through blood that sins are remitted. Well, we, we saw that last week with Cain and Abel. And uh, now we're going to carry on. And now the title of this message is, co- is mes- it's named Call Upon the Lord. And, you know, we're not going to get to that to the last couple of verses. But the meat of this message, well, it's gonna, you're going to have to wait until the middle or towards the end of the message to get to the meat. But there's other information that is given to us that is very important. And starting in verse 17, It says, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mahujel, and Mahujel begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives, The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. I'm going to stop right there for a second. You know, we see what's happening here. Cain goes on, and he builds a city. And that's very important. The the, the message that, that God is giving us through his word today is man continues on, and he starts to build. And he's been building ever since. I really wanted to get a picture of the city of uh, Dubai. Anybody ever seen the picture of Dubai? It was a planned city. Man, I'm telling you, what man can do. The engineering. It's amazing. But it starts right here, the first city that is built. And Enoch built that city, and he called, or I'm sorry, Cain built that city, and he called it Enoch. I don't know where it is. But then it goes on, and it shows us generations as the next next generation comes. And then all of a sudden, it comes to this man, Lamech. And it says he took for himself two wives. Two wives. This is the first polygamist, okay? Is that God's way for you to have two wives? Three wives? A thousand wives? One's enough. One's enough. Well, I don't want to go deep into that subject, but here we are. This is kind of showing us that this man, Lamech, and he comes from Cain, I want to do it my way. And that's what's inferred here in these verses. Man progressing, forgetting about God and not paying attention to God. Cain builds a city, but I'm reminded that it says, in the Psalms, I think it's Psalm 120, well, 125, 126, somewhere. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. And, you know, it's not that God doesn't want mankind to build cities. He does. But he wants to be involved. And it, the inference here is that God is not involved in the building of these things. Men are continuing on 
without giving God a thought. And Lamech here says, <clears throat> no, I'm going to have two wives. And it gives us the name, names of his wives. And then it says what, the children that they born. And it says, and Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. So it was Jabal and Jubal. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. You see, in those verses, we see man begins to build cities, he builds an economy culture with the music and industry that's what is happening but as i said before there is not a mention of god in here at all they are forgetting god that's the inference of what god is showing to us they're not giving god a thought they forget god and are busy building a world system that runs contrary to their creator. That's what we see here. It's the beginning of this. Because we'll see it in the next few chapters. What's coming by Genesis chapter 6? A flood. Because man has progressed to the place where his thoughts are only evil continuously. And God needs to take care of business. So they are forgetting God and they are busy building a world system that runs contrary to their creator. And you know, that goes on today. How many people forget God and are not thinking of God whatsoever as they build and they buy and they sell? That's what Jesus said is going to be the marks of before he comes that they're going to build and they're going to get married. They're going to be given in marriage. They're going to buy. They're going to sell. And we see that goes on and on and on and on. But they forget about God. You know, we'll have to, if you ever, did you ever read Revelation 17 and 18? It's the world system. And what happens in Revelation 17 and, 17 and 18? God takes care of it. He wipes it out. They're working towards a one world system. They were doing that in Genesis. And God confused their language. But. They're speaking in one language now. And they're trying to build a world system. There will be a world system built. It's, it, it's, we're on their way there, our way, way there now. It's happening all around us. But God's going to take care of it in Revelation 17 and 18 because they forget about God. And that's what the inference is here. But let's go on verse 23 of Genesis chapter 4. It says, Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain sh shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Here's this man, Lamech. And he's got his two wives. He begins to say a poem. But he says something here in this poem. He has killed a man. What for? For hurting me. For wounding me. I think it says in the King James. This man wounded him somehow. And so what did he do? He killed him. Is that the way the Lord wants things to happen? No. This man, Lamech, seems to be very arrogant and defiant against God's ways. And he takes vengeance on someone. Are we supposed to be taking vengeance on people when they do things? What are we supposed to do? Bless them. Let the Lord take care of it. Forgive them, which is not easy to do. Not at all. 
But this man, he brags to his wives that he killed a man, that he murdered somebody. And he points back to his ancestor Cain. And you remember when Cain murdered his brother, God put a mark upon him. He was worried that somebody was going to take vengeance on him. So God put a mark on him and, and, and warned people, hey, if you kill do anything to Cain, you will be avenged seven times by me. Well, Lamech here seems to be saying he's claiming God's protection. Either he's claiming God's protection or he's bragging that, hey, I don't need God's protection. That I'll take vengeance. And how many times will he take it? Well, it says 77-fold. I'm not sure if that means 77. I've heard some commentators say it means 70 times 7. At 490, I'm going to, you wait till I get vengeance. You know, I'm going to take care of business. He seems to be defiant and arrogant, spitting in the face of God, this, this man Lamech. 490, does that remind you of anything else in the Bible? Yeah, Peter and Jesus had a, had, a, had a discussion. Peter said, how many times should I forgive my brother up to seven? You know, he was being magnanimous, you know. And what did Jesus say? Seventy times seven. So four, you can take vengeance on the 491st time, right? No. It's an idiom that says, always forgive, right to the end no matter what they've done to you. So Lamech, well, he should have learned to forgive, like we all need to learn to forgive and not take vengeance uh, on people who have done something to us. And they do things to us, right? This man wounded doesn't say how he was wounded. You know, was it with a, a weapon of some sort? Probably some sort of a weapon. He wounded Lamech. But... Maybe it was with words. Sometimes that's all it takes for us to want to take vengeance, right? The words people speak to us. Man, we need to learn to forgive. That's what we learn from this. I'm always looking for ways that this is all going to apply for us today in 2022. And so it does apply to us. And then it comes to the last two verses in Genesis 4, verse 25, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Let me just stop right there. Seth is born, and his name is Seth. It means something. The name Seth means appointed. Okay? And it says, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel. And again, Eve is thinking that this is the man. This is the one chosen. You know, he's not the particular man, but it is this line. And that's why we know his name today, because God wants us to know the name of Seth. There's many other brothers and sisters that are born. Adam had many other children. But for some reason, all we know the names of are Cain, Abel, and Seth. Well, for this reason, we need to know the name of Seth because it's the line of Jesus. You can follow it all the way through, and we're going to see it next week as we go through Genesis chapter 5, that you will see the line of Seth, that it goes to Noah, and from Noah on to Abraham, and from Abraham on to David, and on from David all the way to Jesus. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 1. It's the word that says this. This is the line of Seth. This is the appointed one. And then in verse 26, And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord, and there is our meat for today. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Such a strange little phrase in Genesis 4. Do we know what, the, what was trying to be said here? They began to call upon the name of the Lord. 
As I said, the inference here is for, for the most part, man has forgotten God. Generations have gone by, and, and is this the first revival? That's what I heard from some commentators. This is the first real revival. Men be, began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, you know, I can't get into details about where this comes from or what really happened back in Genesis 4. All I know is that men began to call upon the name of the Lord, and I want to magnify that to us today. Calling upon the name of the Lord. And I just got to ask you straight up, are you in the group that calls upon the name of the Lord? <laughs> yes. Hallelujah for that. Because there are, there's a bigger group, it seems, that don't. And they have forgotten God. And maybe we do too. We're going to see in a few chapters that even this line seems to forget. There's always one, though. There's always one, at least one. Don't ever feel like you're alone in worshiping God. You know, Noah, he might have had you know, uh, that kind of thought. I'm the only one left, me and my family. But we're not like that, are we? We have each other today. And we should call upon the name of the Lord together. But I wonder, at this point in time in Genesis 4, has mankind pretty much forgotten God, left him off to the side with all their building, with all their music, with all their industry, they have forgotten God and His ways, that He wants to be involved with this. It is amazing, though, if you think about it, though, as we just read about uh, Cain and all his, his descendants and, and what they did, and, and how they were the father of music, things like that. Are those bad things? No. But I started to think, you know, it's amazing. Man can build such reasoning and such engineering, such wonders. As I spoke about that city of Dubai, or I mean, we can think about other things that are built these days. It's like, how'd they do that? I'm amazed at the tunnel that they built to go under the Chesapeake Bay that you can drive under. That ships go over. Who, who did that? That's amazing stuff. Man's ability. God gave us the ability to just do amazing things. You don't really see animals building cities, do you? I mean, maybe you can consider an ant. Ants build little ant hills. Uh, bees have hives. You know, they're building things that that's instinctive but man has the capability to do so many great and wonderful things and when we think about the music that's made beautiful music we enjoy music did you enjoy the worship this morning thank god for our musicians bless them lord man it's just amazing give us more and by by the way i heard mike say today we need a bass player just, just putting it out there. I don't know all of you if you can play the bass. Maybe you're hiding it from me. Or maybe you can sing. Use it for the Lord's glory. But let me get back to this. Has mankind at this point in, point in time forgotten God? And maybe there's a group of people in Seth's line that are saying we need to return to the Lord. I'm going to tell you today, if you return to the Lord, He will return, He, he will restore, He will revive, and He will renew. He's waiting for us to return. And maybe that's what's happening here. Men began to call on the name of the Lord. Maybe there was something inside of them we need to get back to God and His ways. Does that apply to us today? Does it apply to our nation? Does it apply to us as individuals? Yes. We need to have that. Never get the thought that you are too far gone from God. How far away is He? 
One step. That's all. Turn towards him, and he will turn towards you. It reminded me, and it's going to be on the wall, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. At this point in time, Samuel is leading the country. He's going around the countryside, going to all the towns, and he's teaching the word of God. But at this point in time, because of previous leaders, men are basically doing what they want to do doing what was right in their own sight. But Samuel just keeps on preaching the word, going from city to city, town to town, preaching the word, sowing the seed. That's what he was doing. And he did it for years. And it says in verse 2, So it was that the ark remained in kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. What did that look like? I stop and listen. I, I meditate on this verse. What did that look like? All the house of Israel. What is that? That's national. What would it look like if all the house of America lamented after the Lord? What would it look like? Wow. But what happened? How did this happen? Didn't, you know, I know that Samuel's been preaching and he's going, but it doesn't say that there was a big evangelistic meeting and, and Billy Graham showed up and, um, and everybody repented. It doesn't say that. It just said all of a sudden there was a national lamentation. Something came through the whole nation saying, we need to return to the Lord in his ways it says in verse 3 then samuel spoke to all the house of israel saying if you return to the lord with all your hearts and then put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you and prepare your hearts for the lord and serve him only he will deliver you from the hand of the philistines and if you were to continue to read in that chapter, you would see that they came to Samuel saying this, we want to we wanna return to the Lord. There's a lamentation here. And the Philistines are watching and they're thinking, oh, they're gathering together for war. And so the people began to tremble and be fearful because the Philistines are coming now. And they said, pray to uh, pray the Lord for us, Samuel. And what did Samuel do? He took a lamb. And sacrificed it. One lamb sacrificed. And it said the Lord shook things up and took care of took care of the Philistines. That's what it takes. But it has to start with a returning to the Lord. A, a individual decision on our part. You know, I need to get back. I need to get back to the Lord. And how far away is he? One step. In the wall, Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, another time period in Israel's history where they have forsaken the Lord and forgotten him. And he sends locusts and he, all kinds of locusts to take care of their crops. It says in Joel chapter 2, verse 12, Now therefore says the Lord, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart. Isn't that the key here? It's your heart. And not your garments. Don't do it outwardly. But with your heart. Return to the Lord your God. Right there. Return to the Lord your God. For he is what? Oh, didn't we sing about that today? You're so merciful, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Hallelujah. That's what we sing about. We live in the age of grace. Unmerited favor, he is patiently waiting, and he is gracious. Why do we think, why do people think that God is a tyrant and wants to destroy us, smoke us? He doesn't. He's gracious. 
gracious and merciful, slow to anger of great kindness. So there's a return here. And that's maybe what happened here in this situation that men began to call upon the name of the Lord because that was working in, the, in them. I don't know for sure, but I, I think that's what's happening. There's a revival of some sort. Men began to call on the name of the Lord. Psalm 55, verses 16 and 17. I'm going to give you a bunch of verses here, and I didn't touch the surface of all the verses that talk about calling upon the name of the Lord. David writes this, As for me, see, that's where it begins. You know, we'd like it to be corporately and nationally, but it has to start individually with each one of us. We make that determination. I like these three words that David says, as for me. That's kind of like, I don't care what you all do, are doing, but as for me, I will call upon God. I love that. As for me, I will call upon God. You have to determine in your heart that that's what you're going to do. How often should you do it? Once every Sunday? Well, we're going to see. It says, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry how? Aloud. Cry aloud. I mean, he can hear your thoughts and he can hear your whisper. You might be whispering your prayer and that's okay. He can hear. But I think for sometimes we just need to cry out loud. Lord, help. <laughs> and maybe it's just that simple of a prayer. But how often for David, it says evening and morning and at noon, I will pray. Evening, that's the beginning of the Jewish day. Evening, morning, and at noon. He shall hear my voice. You know, I know that we all have things to do, lots of responsibilities. It's hard to think about the Lord all day long. But maybe, you know, you want to take breaks every so often. Determine, okay, at noon, I'm just going to take a, a break and cry out to the Lord. I'm going to call out upon his name. He hears you. It reminds me of Daniel. It says in Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel went to his window, opened it up, and prayed three times that day when they made a, a rule that you couldn't pray anymore, right? They made a law. You can't pray anymore. What did he do? He opened up his windows towards Jerusalem and began to pray. And it says three times that day, as he had done since he was a teenager doesn't say teenager, a youth. We're all in that group. We're all young people, aren't we? That was his habit. Did Jesus have that habit too? Every day, pray. Crying out to the Lord. I want to tell you, I want to be part of this group that calls upon the name of the Lord. I want to be known as part of that group that calls upon the name of the Lord. I don't want to be a part of the other group that forgets about God. But every day, I want to be part of this group. You know, it says, the Lord shall save me. As we read first thing today, he is our refuge. He's our strong tower. He's our shield. He's our protector. He will guard us. Do you have confidence in that today? And David said, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall. Is there a maybe in there? Shall save me. I'm going to tell you, I value greatly my relationship with God, my maker. I value, that's, that has the highest priority. What do you value more than anything else? Do you value that, your relationship with the Lord? See, these other people, Cain and his, his descendants, they forget about God. They do not value. And there's whole myriads of men and women across our world today who do not value the things of God. They don't value. They don't care. 
Esau we're going we're gonna to see. He didn't even value the birthright, which was to carry on the things of God in his family. I don't want to be part of that group. I want to be part of the group that calls upon the name of the Lord. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7 say, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. There's going to be a day when those people in this world are not going to be able to be near the Lord. While he is near, you can call upon him. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him, what? Return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Amen. He will abundantly pardon. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, another time when Israel had forgotten about God and worshipped other gods, and God said, you're going to go into captivity for 70 years because of this. You guys know this. But what did he promise Jeremiah after 70 years? I didn't put this, but it's the previous verse, I think. Verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Do you hear God speaking to us today? <laughs> Do you hear him through his word saying, Come, call upon me. Return to me. When you search for me with all your heart, you will find me. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me <clears throat> in the day of trouble. I say call upon him every day, whether it's a day of trouble or not. But can you call upon him in the day of trouble? Any kind of trouble whatsoever? Is our world troubled? Are missiles flying? Is there wars and rumors of wars? All kinds of things to make us anxious. That's a day of trouble. Jacob's going to have seven years of trouble, the nation of Israel. That's what it's called. It's called the day of Jacob's trouble. Call upon me in the day of trouble, whatever trouble it is that you have. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. Yes, hallelujah. He's near. How many times is He going to tell us in the Scriptures that we can call upon Him? I, like I said, I, I did not touch the surface of this. But I, I'm giving you a lot, aren't I? If you want a copy of my notes, you can have them. Or you can take your own. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He also will hear their cry and save them. Psalm 86, verses 5 and 7. For you, Lord, are good. We sang that today. And ready to forgive abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. I mean, as I read these scriptures to you, are they doing anything to me? Is there anything going on inside? Is it, is it kind of strengthening your faith? When you call upon the Lord, is He going to answer? It says He will answer. Yes. So that's why I read these scriptures. I, I put them up there so that you can see them. This is a see and say kind of lesson. I say it, you hear it, you look at it, you see it, you write it down, you take it home. And you, I, I'm going to call upon you, Lord. 
It says also in that verse in Genesis that they called upon the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. Call upon his name. What does his name mean? When it's, uh, I mean, I could go forever. I could do three sermons on his name. No, uh, why don't you, why don't you take that th- thought home and do your own study on the name of the Lord? His name is Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? Provider. He's a good father. He provides. He's our Redeemer. He's our Healer. You know, the name here, they called upon the name of the Lord. Lord there is Yahweh. And it means the Becoming One. The Becoming One. What does that mean? It means He becomes what you need. Anything and everything that you need. He's the Provider. He's the Healer. Do you need healing today? It says that in Acts 3.16, you remember Peter and John, as they, after the day of Pentecost, they were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, but they met somebody along the way, a beggar who was what, lame? And uh, he was begging for money. And and, uh, he looked at Peter and John, and Peter and John, they... uh, Peter said to him, hey, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I give to you. What else did he say? In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The name of Jesus means healer. It means salvation. It's what it actually means, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But... In this instance, it says here, as they go into the temple, and I can just see the man, you know, jumping around behind Peter as he's trying to explain to everybody else what's going on here. I can see the man dancing and jumping, and I probably would be dancing with him. You know, yeehaw! What a day. What an awesome day. Think about that. And they're wondering, how did this happen? Peter says to them, it happened in, his, in the name of Jesus. Acts 3.16, and his name through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of y'all. Yep. In the presence of y'all, he's given perfect soundness. This man who had never been able to walk in his life knew what it was like. And how did it happen? In the name of Jesus. How much authority is in the name of Jesus? When you call upon the name of God, what are you tapping into? This should be building your faith today. Faith in prayer. Faith in calling out to God whether it's a day of trouble or, or not a day of trouble. Calling out in His name, saying, I'm not going to forget you, God. You have been good to me. We sang that song. God, you're so good to me. <laughs> you want to keep going, don't you? <laughs> yes. Man, He's good. He's good to us. And we can... Just call out his name and say, God, you're good. You're so merciful, so kind, so gentle, so forgiving. Hallelujah. That's, do you know his name? Do you know his name? That's what it means. I mean, we can know people's names. Somebody walked in here today and sat down. I don't know her name yet. I hope to know her name. I hope. Do I know her? Not yet. I know you. 
deeper relationship. Some people know God and they know who he is, but they don't actually know him. And that's what that we're talking about today. Do you know his name, what it means? Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. What a great psalm, the whole thing. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my rock, He is my refuge. But I can't do that right now. At the end, God begins to speak. This is God speaking. Because He has set His love upon me, therefore I will deliver Him. I will set Him on high because He has known my name he has known my name they called upon the name of the lord do you know his name and what it means i love this he has set his love upon me he has set his affection he or she have you set your affections upon the lord today have you done it from your heart lord i love you I love your house. I love your people. Because he has set his love upon me. Not thinking about things on earth, but thinking, setting your affections on things above in heaven. God notices when you do that. And he says, because you have set your love upon me, I will deliver you. I will set him on high. What does that mean? Out of reach. Out of reach. Like when I was a kid, we used to go to the grocery store and they had all the toys up at the top rack and I was out of my reach. I can't, Dad, would you buy me one of those? No. (laughs) Out of reach. You'll be put out of reach from the enemies. His protection. Oh, verse 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. How many times have we read that today? I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What great promises. I challenge you to memorize those three verses. I challenge you all to do that today. Long life I will satisfy him. That means eternal life, everlasting life. Showing my salvation, that, that's Jesus. His name means salvation. I will show him, I will make sure he knows the way of salvation. Jesus. Jesus. Psalm Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Those who know your name, they'll put their trust in his name. He said, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. He said that to Abraham. He speaks it to us. I am your shield. Thou, Lord, art a shield about me. That's right. Hallelujah. Mm, Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the lord and who meditate on his name think about his name how much do you think about the lord every day did you ever analyze that i think about him all the time all the time and the the lord sees it i i I read this then those who feared the lord spoke to one another i i they texted one another. John, John Marsh, every morning, without fail, he texts me just a scripture. Doesn't tell me, he doesn't write it out, just the reference. 
doesn't say anything to me. He just speaks. He's speaking the word of God to me, and I send him back something. We're speaking to one another, and, and the Lord sees it. That's what this says. How do we speak to one another? If you ever feel like it, you get a verse and you need to text me it, go ahead. Three final verses I have to get to. I said that Jesus means salvation. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I don't know. Anybody here need salvation today? Yeah, every day we need to be saved, you know. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're saved. Saved from the wrath to come. But I have to put it out there. I think I know all of you. I have to put it out there, though. If you don't know the Lord today as your Savior, he is the, He's the only way. This is the day. Don't wait. Don't wait. Call upon His name. His name means salvation. Acts 4.12, Peter again speaking, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I called upon the name of the Lord for salvation. That's what needs to happen. I uh, pray that you've already done that. If you have, rejoice. Yes. But if you haven't, don't wait. There's no other name. There's no other way. There's just one name. Jesus Christ, Son of God. And finally, Romans 10, 13. Paul writes to us and says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They called upon the name of the Lord. Was that a first revival? I don't know. I don't know. But for us today, it can be. It can be. Revival for you, I say, in prayer, saying, you know, I don't pray enough. I, I need to pray more. I need to call upon his name. I, I need to re be reminded that you can call upon his name and, and that he will answer. And that you need to have confidence that he will answer. But the greatest thing today is if the, you don't know the Lord, he is your salvation. He is the only salvation. Whoever calls on the name, if you call on the name of the Lord today, it says you shall be saved. Saved. Hallelujah. Let's all stand and we'll, we'll pray. Lord, as for me, I will call upon the Lord, and you will save me. And Lord, we do that today. We come before your presence. We can look up, open our eyes, lift up our hands, lift up our soul. We can call upon you, and we know that you hear us today. We have great confidence, and that you will answer us. We thank you today. But Lord, I do pray for those that may be listening may hear this message and they realize that they have forgotten you or maybe put you off to the side, not made you the priority in their life. And today is a day that they would call upon you and all the day long. Make that decision. As for me, I will call upon God. And Lord, maybe there's those that have not been saved. And they need to have that salvation and the confidence of it today. Let them call upon the name of Jesus. I know that you will have mercy and that you will answer. And we thank you today from the bottom of our hearts for our salvation, for the promise of eternal life. We thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.